So I'm going to introduce Apostle Nikita right now, and I'll just ask her to share her thoughts. She is, um, she attended the University of South Carolina and joined the United States Air Force Reserve Officers Training Corps, and she was commissioned as a second lieutenant upon graduation in 1982. She served in the Air Force for 10 years, traveling to various countries in the Middle East as a tactical communications officer. She's a Desert Storm veteran. She's married to Apostle Terry Robinson, and together they have eight children. Wow, eight children and four grandchildren. So Terry, her husband, achieved the highest rank as an enlisted non-commissioned officer as an E-9 sergeant major. So they might have some stuff for us to glean. And um, I'm going to ask her to share now. And uh, maybe later on at the end, we can ask her some questions if you have any. So Terry, you want to take it over? I mean, um, Nikita? Yes, ma'am. God bless each of you on tonight. It's a privilege um, to have this opportunity to share um, a little from my military experience. My husband called and said he was held up at work. So he says, carry on um, until he gets here. And so if he doesn't, all is well. But um, I do have, I think, some insight that will help you to understand as Apostle Faith has shared what the expectation is for us as saints of God, sons of God, that we just don't get to lay back chill until the rapture and all is well. Um, if that's the case, once we got saved, you know, we've been immediately raptured into his presence and just lived out the rest of our days in glory, you know, just enjoying his presence. But it's a little bit more to it than that. And it's really a wonderful opportunity to serve the kingdom of God. Um, as my bio said, I spent almost 10 years as an active duty communications officer. Um, and I got some notes here and Faith has already covered some of the scriptures that I wanted to kind of lay as a foundational um, uh, groundwork, because if we don't understand who we are and what we're called to do, that is probably 99.9% .9 of the problem and the weakness that we see in the church at large. And so first I wanna say it's an honor to be a part of this group where we have warring women who understand their role and have accepted the call of God to be a part of his last day army, his end time army. And so Apostle Faith have already touched on Ephesians 6, where it talks about that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. So it tells us that we are in a wrestle, we are in a battle, and you have to recognize who your enemy is. That is, again, a major part of the weapon tree that you use is the end of the recording. I want to go first to 2 Corinthians 10, um, chapter, 2 Corinthians 10, um, verse 3 through 6, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 6, and read again, just establishing the, the foundation of why we must understand who we are and what we've been called to do, especially with the mindset that when Jesus said it is finished, that that means everything was finished. It was for him but it was just starting for us and our new role and our new identity. It says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. We all know that the major battlefield is the mind. You have to bring every thought because that's where the enemy really operates and try to get you to deny or even denounce who you really are. So um, before we even get into our communications training, that's who I was a communications officer, there was basic training. And at Fort Jackson in South Carolina, Columbia, South Carolina, I am from South Carolina. And so when I go by Fort Jackson, I see this billboard that says, victory starts here. 
okay? We're talking about basic training where soldiers come in on a bus, whatever, they're in their civilian clothes, and the first thing that's taken from them is their civilian clothes, and they're issued a military uniform. Immediately, their identity has shifted. The mindset that you're no longer a civilian, but you're now in the Army. In my husband's case, I was in the Air Force. Wow. So let me back that up with scripture. Let's go to um, 2 Timothy 3. And I want to read that to you from three translations because it's significant, again, that we understand who we are and our identity as saints of God, as sons of God. Whole, all of creation, it says in Romans 8, is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God, the mature ones, those who know who they are. So I'm going to start 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 in the King James. It says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangled himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who have chosen him to be a soldier. Listen to this in the Amplified Classic, verse 3 and 4. It says, take with me your share of hardships and sufferings. Uh-oh, we don't like that word. Which are called to endure as a good first-class soldier of Jesus Christ. No soldier when in service gets entangled in the enterprises of civilian life. His aim is to satisfy and please the one who enlisted him. And then in one of my favorite translations, I've just really come to love because the way it, it just oozes to me, the love of God, and that is the Passion Translation. And I want to read again um, those two verses. And it says this, overcome every form of evil as a victorious soldier of Jesus, the anointed one. For every soldier called to active duty, come on, must divorce himself from the distractions of this world so that he may fully satisfy the one who chose him. And so when a soldier or an airman or a seaman or a marine enter into basic training, that's their main goal, to be divorced from any distractions of the civilian world. In fact, there's several weeks into your training before you can even call home and let mama, big mama know you okay. Because now you've joined into the army, you've joined into the air force, and you are walking in a new reality. It's so much of a new reality that the installation has everything that you need. It has the PX, the commissary, hospital, housing. All you need is founded on that installation. So there's no reason to go anywhere else. And I believe part of the issue is because unless we have that mindset shift, we're still seeing ourselves as who we were before we were born again, born from above, born anew and that's why it's important to renew your mind as paul tells us in romans 2 that we're not to be conformed any longer to this world but we must be transformed by the renewing of the mind and so once we go through our basic train and again the slogan is victory starts here and i believe too that's a major uh deficiency in the church is the lack of training or the people don't think they need to be trained. You're now dealing with a whole new mentality, a no, a, 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 another reality, and you have to be trained to think like a born again believer, like a saint. We're not sinners saved by grace. We are saints of the most high God. We've been called with a holy calling and with a high purpose to fulfill in this season or in your lifetime. And so um, once you finish the basic training, um, I was sent to Keesler Air Force Base to be trained then as a communications officer. And so that training is quite different. You're specifically given um, the information you need to walk in that particular career area. Um, my training there was nine months. And I like what Apostle Faith said, you know, uh, the Air the communications 
people, we were sent to Keesler. If you were logistics, you were sent to another base. If you were medical, you were sent to another base. So your training is specific to what you were commissioned to do. And so we need to learn how to stay in our lane and we learn how to support the other career areas. There was no jealousy, no competition. We were all part of one mission and one team. And so after I finished Keith, I think it was about eight months, I was then sent to my duty location, which was March Air Force Base in Riverside, California. And my first duty assignment, I was a communications officer in 15th Air Force of Strategic Air Command. And the Strategic Air Command, we had control or responsibility for two thirds of the nuclear triad. There are three different legs to that. You have the air launch, you have the ground launch, which are the missiles in the uh, Midwestern part of the United States, and then you have the sea launch. Well, as a communications officer, it was my job to ensure that communications was established and stayed established from the command post to those missile sites and the airborne aircraft. Because at any moment, and we were taught this, and I think another element that's missing in our Christian walk, we're so taught humility is correct, sobriety is correct. The scripture says, don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to think, but you ought to be sober. That means you ought to see yourself as God sees you and not to be uh, have false humility where we think we're a worm and, you know, we don't, we can't. No, we can do all things that Christ has called us to do. And so as that 15th Air Force communications officer, command post officer, I was taught, we were taught that if we didn't do our job, that at any minute, the communists, which was really big at that time, because we were still underneath the Red Scare, that the communists could come over our borders at any moment and just destroy. So we walked uh, faith, we, we didn't call it, we weren't cocky, but we were confident in who we were and what our role was. Because if we didn't do it, we were taught that if they can't talk, if they can't communicate, then they can't fight. The pilots and the, and the missile launchers, they can't do their job. So we were given that grave responsibility to understand who we were and how we fit, come on, how we fit and to the overall mission. It wasn't just about 15 Air Force. We were in the command post. I'm at my desk and it's just little old me. And I, you know, no, I understood very well how I fit into the overall mission. And that all came through with training and that came with, you know, um, intimacy or connection with my commander. We had to take correction, and that's another thing saints don't like. They think they got it all right, but there's some things you have to learn. Even, even the scripture says Jesus learned obedience by the things that he suffered. So there's some things you have to learn. You don't come in knowing it all. You have to submit yourself and allow yourself to be taught. I'm not talking to the ladies on this, this call because we all hear, but some saints, they're not teachable. They, you know, they, they, they're lone rangers. And they think they can do it all within themselves. And that's not even how Jesus modeled his life as he walked the earth. And so after leaving um, uh, Riverside, March Air Force Base, I then was sent to, sent, 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 that's a powerful word. I was sent to Shaw Air Force Base in South Carolina under the Tactical Air Command. Now we're dealing with battlefields. We're dealing with, you know, going to an actual war zone. Whereas in Strategic Air Command, I was in the comfort of a command post miles away, come on, miles away from the danger, but under the Tactical Air Command, now we were going into battlefield situations. And to prepare us for that, we would have what we call exercises, Bright Star, um, where we would go overseas. And I spent most of my time in Egypt. Yes, I was on a war planning team where I went as a female into Egypt and we I helped write the communication portions of battle war plans. And so we would go in to a bare base. That means when we got there, we be in communications, we were one of the first ones in and one of the last ones out. When we arrived, there was nothing there. So the logistics had to show up, communications had to show up. And so Nikita, why are you sharing this? It's the significance of everybody. 
There was no one unit that was more important than the other. All was needed in order to prepare that base for the flyboys, we would call them, when the airplane showed up. So you had logistics. They had to build the latrines, which is bathrooms, mess hall, sleeping quarters, transportation. The, uh, we had military air com airlift command where all of our equipment was airlifted either from Europe or from the United States into the Middle East. So it took a unified effort, okay? And when one particular unit or agency felt like, you know, certain things were beneath them, that would hinder the mission. We all had to see ourselves as being very significant. And so with communications, you know, even with the air traffic control, the planes could not land until there was communications established so air traffic could guide them in. And so by the time the pilots got there, everything was set. There were the, la the last ones in, but also the first ones out. But the they were the main ones that we were supporting. And we were that's what we knew we were called to do. So as a communications officer, I was very much privy to a lot of the conversations and operations where we had to learn what was, what was the plans for the operations that day and how we could support them communications wise, even weather dependent on communications intel. And I love what Faith said about um, the seals. Oh no, there's no way if intel gave us information about the enemy or that any of the um, positioning of the enemy had shifted, would we allow them to go in and blind? But they had to have communications even to communicate the real time um, intel. And so all what I'm saying is, if you don't know who you are, if you don't know what your mission is and how you fit into the big picture, it's easy to take on either a lackadaisical attitude or a high minded attitude where you think it's all about you when really it is not. You're fitting into a larger mission and doing what um, that mission calls you to do. And so as a veteran of Desert Storm, when I got there, um, everything was established. I came on the uh, on one of the, uh, the, the latter teams that showed up. So within two days after my being there, as we would say in the Air Force, the balloon went up, the war started. And it was initially an air war. And so why was it that? Well, if you don't establish air superiority, then the troops cannot fight on the ground. So now you have a relationship, not just within the Air Force, but now there's a relationship between the Air Force and the Army. So before the Army ever hit the ground to go into Iraq, to go into um, Kuwait rather, to drive out the Iraqis, they had to establish air superiority. And that's an Air Force function. And then also what the Air Force did, is called air interdiction where you cut off supply lines, you cut off the enemy supply line so that the people, the troops on the front line, they cannot get the food, they cannot get the water, they cannot get their weaponry. So not only were we establishing our superiority, but we were also dealing with the enemy. So it's very significant to understand who your enemy is, where he is, and, where, and, what, and what is his main objective. So then you know how to counteract what he's doing. And so in the scripture, it says very clearly, um, it says, we will not have you ignorant, Paul says, I will not have you ignorant of Satan's devices, Satan's strategies. And so if we're just lackadaisical, just tiptoeing through the tulips and just waiting for the rapture, come on, or just going about your daily, because let me tell you something, what you do in your church is not who you really are. That's, that's where you go to be trained, the fivefold, my God, within the walls of the church, but when you leave the church, what do you do for the kingdom? What are you being equipped to do? What are you being equipped to build? What are you being equipped to take? Come on. The scriptures all said, occupy till I come. What are you occupying? And that even is also a military term. After World War II, the United States occupied Japan for about six years. And Japan, because of military, U.S. military occupation and other alliances, was a far better nation than it was before World War II. And so when you occupy, you're, you're, you're holding territory and you're making it better. 
you, you're causing it to look like the kingdom. But a lot of issue, again, like I said earlier, starts in the mind. So the message of John the Baptist and Jesus the Christ was both repent for the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is at hand. So that soldier, that military mindset, we had to buy into it. If we were told, in fact, if I can go back to basic training just for a minute, sometimes they were asked to do seemingly mindless tasks. Go over there and dig a hole, okay? Now go back and fill the hole in. Wait a minute. They were training them how to take orders, how to do what they were being asked to do. But we live in a generation that everybody wants to know why. Nobody wants to submit to authority, but we have to be honest. There is a ranking and order even within the kingdom of God does not mean you're any less than anybody else, but there is an order and a ranking as God does speak through certain ones and give clear directions as to clear directives of the direction that he will have his church to go in. And so we're in times now where it's very important that we humble ourselves, that we humble ourselves and we'll be willing to listen to what the clarion call is coming forth from people, whether it's male or female, that God has anointed for such a time as this. And as I'm looking at my notes, um, I think there's one other thing I want to talk about that my husband has shown up, is psychops. Psychops is like psychological warfare. And again, dealing with the mind. While we were cutting enemy lines in the supply, leaflets was also being dropped to those frontline soldiers. I'm not sure if you, many of you remember, but Saddam Hussein and his Republican guard, that it was going to be the mother of all battles. They was going to just, just destroy us. And so that was the mindset that his frontline soldiers had. They were ready for blood. They were ready to take us out. But it took us six months to build up. Operation Desert Shield started in August. The actual war didn't start until January. So what were we doing? We were building up, mobilizing, but we were also dropping leaflets, especially when the war began to let them know when their supplies were not coming. If you just surrender, all what you need will be provided for you. We were dealing with their mind. And that's what the enemy does is to us. He tried to convince us that God is not who we say he is. He was successful when he convinced Eve that God was holding out on her, that if she would just eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, she would be just like God. Well, wait a minute. She was already made in the image and the likeness of God. So there is psychological ops, psych ops, where they're wearing you down and trying to change your mind and convince you of things that they will have you to know. And guess what? For the United States, it worked. By the time we were ready to go in with the ground war, the soldiers of the, this, this awesome, bad, to the bone Republican guard came out waving white t-shirts saying we surrender because they had been worn down. And that's what the enemy wants to do. He wants to wear you down. And it says in Daniel, how for a season, the devil, Satan, is going to be given to wear out the saints. And it may not be physically, but it's mentally. That's why you have to renew your mind. That's why it's so significant that in your training, that you know who you are, that you're not deterred or distracted by the things going on around you and the stuff in your ear, the enemy in your ear that's always trying to tell you something different other than who God says you are and your purpose. There are five P's, and then I'm going to turn it over to my husband, that you need to be aware of. Five P's. First of all, your position as a child of God, your purpose, his, um, your, his presence in your life, the power, and there's another one that I wrote down. Okay, I'm going I'm to look that up. Let me see it again. It's your position. You're a child of God. Your possession. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Your possession. What do you possess? Jesus, when he said it is finished, he was dealing with your position and your possession. That the, uh, we, are, we are 
attach to the vine and everything that's in him, the, the, the vine flows into the branch. And you have to know that where your supply comes from. As a saint of God, you live a supplied life. Just like I said in the military, everything we needed was supplied to us. I did not have to pay my own airfare to go from Shaw Air Force Base to Saudi Arabia. I didn't have to buy my own uniforms. They, they fed us, they closed us, they housed us. And you have to know everything that you need is supplied by the kingdom of God. That's where we live from. So your position as a saint of God, son of God, your possession, come on, and then also your his presence in your his presence, his presence in your life, your purpose, because even what you possess is tied to your purpose. What I was equipped with was different than what a pilot or a medical officer, intel officer was equipped with. So even your purpose, and then lastly, the power or authority. I didn't go over there on my own authority. I was sent. And if you would look in the gospels, especially the gospel of John, over 41 times, Jesus emphasized that he was sent. Come on, that he was sent. And when you are sent, you got the backing of the nation that's sending you or the country that's sending you. So again, those five Ps, position, possession, purpose, presence, I'm with you, and power. Amen. Praise God. Amen. She's signaling me, and I know that we probably don't have a lot of time left. God bless all of you. I'm actually just coming in the door from work, but praise God that I was able to at least say hello. Um, to quickly introduce myself for those of you who don't know me, I don't know if an introduction she was, was already she given. Yeah. Okay. Also say, okay. No, she, yeah. Don't don't worry about the time. You okay. Know. This is too good. This is very important. A amen. Well, first of all, God bless everyone again. Um, I, I want to talk to you just a little bit and compare uh, how uh, things go are in the natural versus spiritual when dealing with warfare. First of all, let me start by saying this. I was uh, selected to attend the Army War College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, uh, actually as a civilian employee that was working for the military. An interesting background, I had retired from the Army, enlisted in communications, just like my wife, but I retired a Sergeant Major. And so uh, I was in communication. God led me, and I need you to hear this, God led me to stick in my calling and his intentions for my life with being a civil servant and serving those who serve. So I became a, what we call a Department of Army Civilian and went up to the grade of GS-14. And at that grade, I could apply to attend the War College which meant that I would actually be studying strategies mm -hmm. um, uh, of how we would go about to win. Uh, I'm sure my wife talked about the air land mm -hmm. battle, mm -hmm. uh, but how all of that worked together. But here's what the Holy Spirit told me when I was selected. While you will go and you will be taught from the natural and you will be taught natural strategies, I need you to listen with both sets of ears. I need you to listen with your physical ears, but I also need you to listen with your spiritual ears because I want to teach you things concerning how warfare is conducted in the spirit realm. Mm -hmm. And so I understood that that was my assignment. And I must be frank with you, I was placed in a seminar to primarily uh, give, because I had been an enlisted, the enlisted perspective, the DA Army civilian perspective, and then listen and participate in the officer pers 
effective. And my class was made up of both uh, national, international students mm -hmm. uh, from various countries, uh, all in the rank of a lieutenant colonel or colonel. Um, many had already served in brigade commands. And uh, the there were folks in there from the Coast Guard, the Air Force, uh, the Navy. We would all sit down in a seminar. Mm -hmm. And while they had structured the curriculum to entice our thinking and to generate and foster discussions and learn from one another's and others' experience, we also took a look at history. Yes. We went way back and looked at wars and uh, from Thucydides to all kinds of wars. Uh, Sun Tzu, uh, we, dis we discussed various what they call architects and masterminds of war so that we could glean from their learning. Let me just say this, beloved, God wants us to glean. Mm -hmm. I mean, we could just look at Ruth for a moment. My God, she gave favor, amen, and she was able to glean to not only support herself, but a precious mother-in-law. Really, I like the way my wife said, her mother-in-law. But to fast forward, let me say this. Um, I'd like to share with you some of my major lessons learned while attending the War College. First one is this. I'm going to give you an acronym. Those of you that are familiar with the military know that they uh, my God, they are just a, a boatload, if I can say that and use a Navy term, of acronyms. Yes. But there is one C-O-G. I'm talking about some of my greatest lessons learned. And I want to talk to you about how they apply both natural and spiritual. C-O-G, COG. COG stands for center of gravity. Center of gravity. What is center of gravity? Center of gravity is that one thing, that center, that causes everything else to do what it does and, and function and, 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 and take care of their particular, she talked about the various different aspects and the different missions and the different purposes of the various units that combine for the fight cog that center of gravity is what is that one thing that keeps everything together and in place now that's an interesting concept when we look at the devil first of all because we know he's an author of confusion come on and we know that he loves derision we know that he loves distraction but yet he has to have a way of keeping his I'll say it this way, team, for lack of a better way of saying it, focus. And the focus of the team is really the people of God. Mm. The focus of the team really, Scripture makes it clear, is to kill, steal, and destroy. Uh, some of you may be familiar, amen, with a, a work uh, called The Vision. Amen. Uh, it's a book that the Holy Spirit gave me uh, years ago, actually. And he just put it in my hands and said, I want you, here I go, to glean from it so that you can understand how the enemy works, what their tactics are. Satan comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And let me tell you something about demons. And it was reinforced even in the book, The Vision by Rick Jordan. Again, the vision by Rick Jordan. Uh, it was reinforced even there. But uh, the bottom line is spirits of derision and confusion and jealousy, and I can go on and on and on, they're that same way with each other. That's their makeup. That's who they are, just like we train for our specialties in the military. Come on. And in order to keep them from attacking one another, as we act, saw often in the Old Testament, was to have them focused on a purpose and 
uh, going and striving after that purpose. So now I need you to hear this concept. There are things that mm, one through a quick analogy or a quick analysis, I should say, would assume and think, surely that's the center of gravity. And often it's only a symptom. Mm. It's not the center of gravity. My Lord. And see, we have to look at that in the spiritual realm as well. The enemy would love for us to be going at the symptoms versus the center of gravity. But the center of gravity that causes the enemy to do uh, their work in such a, a, I'll say, a disastrous way is their coming. Satan said, what, what did he say when iniquity was found in his heart? Not only was he going to exalt his throne above, we know what Ephesians 6 says about who we warfare against, but he said, I'm going to be like the Most High. In fact, look at what he did and said to Jesus. He, in that last temptation that we are very well aware of, and after that one, of course, he, he, he fled for a season, but he wanted him to bow. Mm. All of these things have been given unto me, and if you'll simply bow, mm. uh, I need you to hear me, beloved, pride. Mm. That thing, that, that eye that's in the middle of pride, uh, that is the clincher that caused the iniquity to be found in Satan, even when he walked before God. Instead of him being grateful and keeping his eyes on all the authority and everything that God had given and done for him, he began to look inward. Mm -hmm. Hear me, beloved. All of our sin in life will be account of one thing and one thing in particular, self-centeredness. Instead of being God-centered, the enemy wants us to be self-centered. I, 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 I. And we don't see how we fit in. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And that's why God has always said, and we're teaching on it currently, that in order for him to use us, We've got to decrease so that he can increase. God is, is so clear in the word. He says that those who humble themselves, he will exalt. Those who exalt themselves, mm -hmm. he will obey. By God, we're teaching on Josiah. And uh, for time's sake, I'll simply say this. If you were to go back and read the story of King Josiah, he ran well because he always, catch this, he wore that mantle or cloak of humility and he sought the law, the Lord. He sought God, he sought God. In other words, he was not presumptuous and that's what we're teaching on right now, but he sought God. God can't use us if we're full of ourselves. God can't use us if we're full of uh, leading to our own understanding. I mean, all of that will burn up wood, uh, wood, stubble, hay, all of that's going to burn. But my God, the precious word of God. And that's what Jesus said man should live by, not bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And that takes a humility because the enemy wants us to think that basically uh, we can lead to our own understanding and God says quick, clearly in Isaiah 55, his thoughts and ways are higher, not different, higher. So let's get back to calm, center of gravity. The bottom line is, if you can find out not what the symptom is, mm. but what the center of gravity is and decapitate it, you can now destroy and, and kill the enemy. But until you deal with that center of gravity, that enemy will continue. It'll be, I'll, I'll give this analogy. It's just like a snake. You can cut off a part of the snake, and the snake can still continue to do what a snake does. But by God, when you decapitate, when you destroy, then that we, we're really in business. So the enemy 
that center of gravity, and let's just deal with that center of gravity. Not only is it pride, not only is it me, myself, and I, my God, but the enemy, because he studies us, the enemy will look for a, any vulnerable opening mm -hmm. that can be used, mm -hmm. and he'll send out his recon forces. Mm -hmm. a, and they may go in small groups. I'm talking about the enemy, but they come with full of his power. I'll say it this way, his anointing. But if the enemy can stir up, I mentioned earlier, jealousy. Mm. Something we've been through in life that mm. we've not been healed of, not recovered of. Mm. If the enemy can stir up hatred, uh, it it a lot of what's going on now is a lot of racial discourse. Mm -hmm. uh, the enemy is a master at taking some of the things that we've been through in life and causing wounds and causing hurt and causing I'll even say seeds to be planted that he can exploit for his own good. So the enemy studies Jesus. the enemy so that he'll know their vulnerabilities and he can do a work on them. God knows us. I need you to hear me, beloved. God not only knows the hairs on our head, but he understands that we have we really do have fears and we have weaknesses. Now, we also have the opposite of that. We have strengths and we have confidence, but the enemy loves to exploit our fears and our weaknesses. Mm. And because of fears and weaknesses, look at what we'll do. We'll lie, we'll cheat, we'll steal, we'll lust, we'll do all sorts of things. And it takes, get this, not only our training, mm -hmm. our practice, mm -hmm. our exercising, our walking, the Bible says it this way, walking in the spirit. So God is constantly, I like to say it this way, he has us on what we call in the military, a confidence course. Mm -hmm. He wants us to have, get this, not faith in our faith. Come on. No part intended, uh, prophet. I'm sorry, uh, apostle faith. Because uh, he want us to have faith in his word. He want us not only to have faith, amen, in his word, but a trust and a confidence in it. And he want that not only to be our battle cry, but he wants that to be our foundation. Jesus said this, you can't do nada. You can't do a thing, okay, unless you abide in the vine. And he wants us to have faith in God. There's a difference between having faith in God and having faith in our faith. Let me talk about that, and I, I will, I think, pass it back over. Uh, but there's a difference between the two. Faith in God means, regardless of what I see, I think, I feel, or even think I know, regardless of that, I understand that the truth is in the word of God. It's not no my truth, it's the truth. It's only found in the word of God. And whatever God says, we can we can go to the bank on it, we can trust in it, and we can look at it. But I need you to hear me and something that God has taught me and has shown me even while attending the Word College. If we don't rightly divide the word of truth, mm. if we don't Jesus. seek God for his rhema word, mm -hmm. let me give you an example. God has told Apostle Nikita et al that this is a Holy Spirit now season for us. He has told us that uh, he's even given us the anointing of now. And what that simply means is, and I need you to hear it because it's for you tonight as well, because it is that season for believers. What that means is there are things that God has groomed, trained, prepared you for, and he's saying, I need you to understand that I need you to occupy and take the land now. Oh, we've been bivouacking. We've been trading. We've been going over plans. We've been going over marching orders. 
But I'm telling you, not only are we moving out, but now we're executing God's plan. Now, I could be foolish to say, well, if God say uh, Holy Spirit now, did anything and everything is now, 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 now. No, that's not what he means. What he does mean is as he speaks to you in, in your intimacy with him, something the enemy loves to interrupt, you seek him, God, what are those nows for now? Because we point Blake Axe, God. Okay, God, so you told us about this and this. Does that mean that door is open right now? And some of those things he's saying, wait, I'll give you an answer. And other things he said, absolutely. And certain things he said, that door is not open now. So I can't just take a word of this is uh, a, a, a Holy Spirit now moment and say everything that God has told me to do to run out and execute. See, that's presumption, actually. Yes. Hear me. There are many people who will presume and they will go to God and ask God for things uh, to do for them in their situations, but they don't ask God, what can they do for him? There are many people that will presume upon the little faith that they have or the faith that they do have. They'll presume upon it and they will try and work it and they will do things, get this, not with God, but for God. Mm -hmm. And we can go Old Testament to New Testament, doesn't work. I'll give you a quick example, King Saul. King Saul said, okay, I get it that you told me to kill it all, but I wanted to say the best to sacrifice unto you. Mm. What did God reveal? That obedience, obedience to what? obedience to his word, obedience to his both logos and his rhema word. You've got to know his rhema word in the season so that you can execute, get this, his orders mm -hmm. and his commands. He said he preferred obedience it's over sacrifice because remember, God will not send his word out and it be void and not accomplish what he sent it to do. And that's why man don't live by bread alone, but by every word, every word, every word that proceeded out the mouth of God. I'll, I'll give you revelation that God shared last night on our broadcast. I need you to hear this as I'm wrapping up. So much more I can say, but uh, I'll give you some revelation. What he had us to share last night, many ministers that are in the Five-fold ministry have had premature deaths and been called home because they did not abide in their calling. Mm. Uh, we can look left and right, and we can desire someone else's gifting and calling and said, I'm going to be like them. But wait a minute. We have an assignment. Amen. Apostle spoke about the various capacities and assignments and functions within the Air Force. Amen. To accomplish that air land battle. Amen. But the bottom line is many ministers did not remain in their calling. And you have to ask yourself why. We asked ourselves, why did Josiah fail? Why did he only live to the age of 31? 39. Thir I'm sorry, 39. Because he was called as a king at the age of eight. But the bottom line is, the conclusion we came to when he was warned by God, King Necho sent emissaries saying, you better not come after me in battle. I don't, I'm not even looking for you. But if you come after me, you are not interfering in God's purpose, in God's strategies, in God's plan. And if you do, you'll be destroyed. Mm, Jesus. What did, uh, King Josiah do? Scripture is clear. He disguised himself as he still went into battle against Egypt. And leading to our own understanding, that makes sense. We're talking Egypt. After all, we're talking Egypt, and he's the king of Judah. But see, uh, let me help you, beloved. God will raise up certain people, and I can certainly call some names right about here, Amen. That we would think, uh, surely 
the spirit of God is not using them or in them. And here King Necho was going after someone that God had judged and one that the nation dealt with. And when King Josiah leading to his own understanding, not seeking God, not remaining humble, Moses wanted to, God said, my servant Moses, one of the most humble, not the most, is uh, the, mo the most humblest on the earth. So I deal with Moses in a totally different way. But let's look at Moses. What happened toward the end of his life? Again, mm. presumption. Jesus. He smote the rock. And he could not go into the promise. And God loved himself some Moses. So, beloved, it's not just a matter of how we finish, but how we conclude. Allow me to say this. Okay, allow me to say this. I'm getting the, I'm getting the nudge, but allow me to simply say this. That uh, we not only can lead to our own understanding, but we can know God from a distance and then expect him, uh, Jesus said, I know whatever I pray that you hear it. Mm. And I'm not saying that he doesn't hear, but I'm telling you more than anything, God wants us to know him. Mm -hmm. He wants us to walk with him. And so it's so important that we not be presumptuous, that we remain humble, that we seek him and wait and get his answer from him so that we can do his will and with that i'll stop i'll <laughs> stop for now i just want to make one last point before we give it back over to faith to open up for questions one thing that you must understand from a military standpoint in the natural look at the power look at the weaponry that's at the disposal of a person you have two captains sitting in a nuclear missile silo where really they could do some damage push some buttons do some things all on their own yes there are authentication codes but there's way that you can you know do stuff and and, and and cause some some serious damage what about a soldier with an m16 we see we see how in our world today all of these mass shootings and so for god to put this kind of power at our disposal and tr trust us with heaven's power. That means that he's taken us through some things. He's walked us through some things. He, he, he allowed us to be dug out, to go through the refiner's fire, because the last thing God is going to have in this season is another Lucifer. He's not going to have another Lucifer. And so with the greater glory and all, all what God is, is pouring out, we've already seen it begin to happen. He's going to entrust it to those who he can trust with this level of glory. Let me interrupt just to say this. Don't ever take matters into your own hand. Did you catch that? Don't ever take matters into your own hand. Go right ahead. And we saw something like this, of course, from the enemy, even with the bombing 9-11, uh, when they ran those, uh, flew those airplanes into those towers so with all the military force and the people the men and women that have access to all of this you don't we don't have a military coup like they have in some other nations where you have military generals who see all the power they have and they overthrow the government and so god in his wisdom he knows who to give what to amen he knows who he can trust and it behooves us, it behooves us to hear, listen for the voice of God. And when he shows you character flaws, when he shows you some things about you that's not yet mature, listen, humble yourself and let God do that deeper work because you are significant. Regardless of what your call is in the kingdom of God, you are very significant, but at the same time, he wants you to be able to trust him get this and for him to trust you amen we're done any questions or have you want to go from here apostle say that was um so good so many points to remember i have to listen to that again 
you know, um, from both of you, but you know what you were saying, it just really struck me about when you enter the army, how you, you take off your civilian clothes and you've That's entered good. into a whole, a whole other realm where everything there is provided for you. Now, if the people of God and the church of God were to live that, wow, we could take the whole world. And it says that in, in 2 Timothy 2, 4, no one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs. Right. And um, that's not just a suggestion. Those things are in the word for, for us to take note of and to live. Right. But, um, and God has been giving me this word for, for recently a lot, just detach. Mm. Detach from everything. Detach from the world. Detach from you know, your, your desires and fleshly dreams for whatever, a house, car, whatever, detach. Because why? Because we're soldiers now in an mm -hmm. army. And we, are, we have to take off those civilian clothes and recognize that we have entered into um, an army camp that is the kingdom of God, where everything is provided for us. And if we live and move in that Based according to the protocols of God, we will be successful. We yes, will be victorious at everything. Yes, ma'am. Because as uh, Terry was saying, it's pride that's going to derail us. Pride that's going to uh, trip us up because God says he resists. Do, you, do we want God to resist us? <laughs> that's pretty scary. Does he yes. resist the proud? And he exalts the humble. So, you know, there's much to think about. But I love that, um, you know, that we um, we take off our civilian clothes. So we put on new clothes. Amen. Now we're soldiers. So mm -hmm. this is pretty powerful. Um, we didn't really land too much on the fifth generation warfare, which I'm going to focus on next week. Um, a little bit we touched on some, I think it was Terry was talking about the PSYOPs or maybe it was Nikita. Mm -hmm. And PSYOPs is just the warfare against our minds. Right. And, um, and, and they're calling that now fifth generation warfare because it's, a, it's not just, um, you know, the enemy going after your mind. It's actually a military strategy to conquer humanity. And they're using technology to do it. So we're in a whole new place and we need to understand it and recognize it so that we can, when we see it, we can just, you know, walk away from it or just not receive it. Um, to recognize it is the first key. Mm -hmm. so, um, we want to go digging into that as much as we can and everything that they're doing right now, all the, the military strategies I mean, it sounds crazy. It's amazing that nations and governments are employing military strategies against its people. And, um, but they are, they're doing that. And the end result is control. They want to control us and keep us locked up, mm. locked down. And, um, and, they're, and they're moving aggressively toward that. So if you don't believe that, you're in for a big surprise because they're moving fast too with these um, 50 minute cities, digital IDs, everything, it, it's coming. And um, I know God is on his throne and God has a plan and there's a massive awakening coming, yes. And when people rise up and discover God, I mean, we outnumber them. So that in itself is a powerful strategy. We, have, we way outnumber them. And um, we will not submit. We will simply not submit to their plans and strategies. And what can they do? So we need to recognize it, first of all, and understand it, first of all. So next week, we will dig into that. Um, 